Hi, I'm Amber, the Emergency Medicine PGY2 Pharmacy Resident, and today I'll be talking about vasopressors in the emergency department. The objectives will be to differentiate between the effects of vasopressor agents on vascular tone and the heart, as well as analyze the risks and benefits of each vasopressor agent, and lastly review the evidence comparing vasopressors and inotropes. Vasopressors are indicated for the use in shock due to insufficient delivery of oxygenated blood to tissues. They're used when shock is not reversed by fluid therapy by increasing the systemic vascular resistance as well as increasing cardiac output. They're titrated to achieve adequate blood pressure allowing for end organ perfusion. Ideally, we aim for systolic blood pressure of 90 or greater or a MAP of 65 or greater. There are multiple different causes of shock, including hypovolemic, distributive, cardiogenic, and obstructive. In hypovolemic shock, we more so are concerned about volume depletion, so we would therefore use fluids and blood products. While throughout the presentation, I will more so be talking about sepsis and cardiogenic shock and the use of vasopressors in these types of causes. It's important to understand the hemodynamics in different types of shock because then we can therefore identify which vasopressor agents would be most appropriate and beneficial. And hypovolemic shock, like I had mentioned, more so concerned about fluid depletion. And the primary change in hypovolemic shock is that there's a decrease in the central venous pressure. In cardiogenic shock, the primary change is that there's a decrease in cardiac output. And in distributive shock, there's both a decrease in the systemic vascular resistance as well as the central venous pressure. Now further breaking it down into which receptors have an effect on hemodynamics, we know that systemic vascular resistance and cardiac output both have an effect on blood pressure. So the alpha-1 and beta-2 receptors are what works on the systemic vascular resistance. So alpha-1, if that's activated, will cause more of a vasoconstriction effect and therefore increase systemic vascular resistance. While beta-2 does the opposite in that it causes vasodilation if activated. And cardiac output is the beta-1 receptor and if activated will therefore increase the cardiac output. In patients with shock, we know that we are using the vasopressor agents due to their hypotension. They can either have a low SVR or an inadequate cardiac output or even have both. So really understanding which receptors we want to work on with our vasopressor agents will help us identify the most beneficial agent. I've provided this chart here to demonstrate the different vasopressor agents that I'll be discussing and their effects on the alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2 receptors. From the top, dobutamine, as you can see, has more of an effect on beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. Dopamine has an effect on all of the receptors, although it is dose-dependent. So at intermediate doses, we'll have more of an effect on beta-1 and at higher doses will then also have an effect on alpha-1. Epinephrine has an effect on all of the receptors equally throughout, and norepinephrine has more of an effect on the alpha-1 receptor, therefore causing more of a vasoconstriction. Phenylephrine is a pure alpha-1 agonist. Now getting into the different types of shock, first I'll be discussing septic shock. Again, the primary change being that there's a decrease in systemic vascular resistance as well as the central venous pressure. The Surviving Sepsis Campaign provides guidelines or recommendations for management of septic shock patients 
And when they discuss the vasopressor agents, they recommend that norepinephrine is the first choice vasopressor. After norepinephrine, you can either add epi or vasopressin to further increase mean arterial pressure. Or vasopressin alone can be used to decrease the norepi dosage. Dopamine is listed as an alternative agent to norepinephrine only in highly selected patients. So this would be a rare situation in which you would have a patient that has a low risk of tachyarrhythmias or have an absolute or relative bradycardia. And then dobutamine can be used if the patient still has persistent hypoperfusion. The use of norepinephrine in septic shock works primarily by increasing the mean arterial pressure through SVR because it has most of an effect on the alpha-1 receptor causing a vasoconstriction and it maintains cardiac output by having some slight effect on beta-1 receptors. Norepinephrine also is the vasopressor that has large amounts of data for use in septic shock and showing its efficacy. Epinephrine, again, can be added to norepi if needed to further increase mean arterial pressure in septic shock. It has an effect on all of the receptors, so essentially what it's doing is going to have an effect on afterload by increasing um, increased cardiac output and also decrease the afterload. So the net effect is that it increases mean arterial pressure by increasing cardiac output and maintaining SVR. There have been trials that compare norepinephrine versus epinephrine, and in the Surviving Sepsis campaign, they do mention that the, these trials have shown no difference between the two. One concern to keep note of is that there is this effect in that epinephrine can cause transient lactic acidosis. It's unknown why this happens, but it's likely due to more of a metabolic effect. One trial that had compared the use of norepinephrine versus dopamine was this trial here and that it was a randomized double-blind study. There were 32 patients with septic shock after adequate resuscitation. And what was found was that 31% of the patients that had received dopamine maintained hemodynamic success for six hours, while 93% of the patients that had received norepinephrine maintained that hemodynamic success. Also, the patients that received dopamine also had to have norepinephrine added um, in 10 of 11 patients who had failed with dopamine alone. So in conclusion to this trial, they had identified that norepinephrine is more potent than dopamine in septic shock, although of course cannot be generalizable to other shock states. Phenylephrine is also a vasopressor agent that could be used in septic shock. What it does, since it is a pure alpha-1 agonist, is it's going to increase the systemic vascular resistance, although there is this reflux that will occur and cause a decrease in heart rate or reduction in cardiac output. A concern with this is that it may induce heart failure. And something to keep in mind is that in the Surviving Sepsis Campaign in 2012, they did make mention of the use of phenylephrine in patients with septic shock that had a tachyarrhythmia and that the reduction in cardiac output may be beneficial. Although there is no mention of phenylephrine's use in the 2016 guideline. Phenylephrine also, compared to the other vasopressor agents, does have a lower risk of causing arrhythmias. Now I'm going to talk about vasopressor agents in the use of cardiogenic shock. Again, the primary change in cardiogenic shock is that there's a decrease 
cardiac output. As far as vasopressor agent recommendations for the use in cardiogenic shock, there really are no guidelines or recommendations to say um, which vasopressor agent is preferred as no single agent has been shown to be uh, superior versus another. And of course, you may have to add on another vasopressor um, to be fully effective in cardiogenic shock. Since there are no specific guideline recommendations for which vasopressor agent to use in cardiogenic shock, what's helpful to think about is what makes up cardiac output. We know that cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume, and stroke volume is dependent on both preload and afterload, or afterload also known as the systemic vascular resistance. Therefore, the heart has less pressure that it would have to work against. Now looking at the vasopressor agents that we could choose from, dobutamine seems to be the most beneficial agent in that it will do both. It'll increase beta-1 effects in increasing cardiac output, as well as have an effect on beta-2, which has that vasodilation property and will lower SVR. Dopamine may also have an effect on beta-1 and beta-2, although I'll talk about further on why dopamine is not a preferred agent in cardiogenic shock. Epinephrine does have an effect on all, although it will only increase cardiac output and maintain SVR because it also has an effect on alpha-1, causing that vasoconstriction. Norepinephrine does have an effect on beta-1, which could increase slightly the cardiac output, and phenylephrine is not a preferred agent um, in that it is a pure alpha-1 agonist, and again, it may have that reflux effect and cause a reduction in cardiac output. Now, the reason that dopamine is not a vasopressor agent that should be used in cardiogenic shock was due to the results of this trial um, by Debacher that was published in 2010. What the trial looked at was a patient population that was admitted to the ICU and these patients were needing treatment for shock. The intervention was that patients either received norepinephrine or dopamine. What they found was that there was actually an increased 28-day mortality in cardiogenic shock patients that had received dopamine. They also found that there was an increase in arrhythmias in all shocks in the patients that had received dopamine. Also, the patients that received dopamine had an increased need for open label pressors. So due to the results of this trial, dopamine is therefore not recommended in cardiogenic shock. I also wanted to briefly talk about neurogenic shock, as this is a shock state that also may be seen in the emergency department. Neurogenic shock occurs after a central nervous system or spinal cord injury. And what happens is that hypotension and bradycardia occur due to an autonomic pathway disturbance. So they're either going to have a decreased vascular resistance causing a decreased overall mean arterial pressure or have a predominant parasympathetic stimulus, which will then cause bradycardia. So these patients could have both hypotension and bradycardia. Unfortunately for neurogenic shock, there also is really no guideline consensus or outcome data to show which vasopressor agent is most beneficial or preferred. Something to keep in mind is that these patients do require a higher mean arterial pressure goal so that there can be better perfusion to the spinal cord. Thinking about what vasopressor agent to use should really be dependent on what the patient is experiencing versus um, it being more hypotension or bradycardia.
Lastly, I have some takeaway points for the vasopressor agents that I discussed. Dobutamine, again, has that increase in cardiac output and decreases systemic vascular resistance, making it the most ideal agent for cardiogenic shock. Although something that I did forget to mention was that it, at high doses, may cause hypotension. The reason for this is because it has an effect both on beta-1 and beta-2, although the beta-1 receptors will become more saturated and then have more of an effect on beta-2 with that vasodilation. The dose is very patient-specific, but just something to keep in mind that if hypotension does occur, that the dobutamine dose may just need to be decreased. Dopamine again does have dose dependent effects and may be associated with mortality um, specifically in cardiogenic shock patients and does have a high risk of causing arrhythmias. Epinephrine does have an increase um, Immune arterial pressure through that effect on cardiac output, and it maintains systemic vascular resistance. It does also have, have that unique adverse effect in that it causes a transient lactic acidosis. Norepinephrine increases mean arterial pressure through systemic vascular resistance while maintaining its cardiac output. And it is the first line for a range of different shocks. Phenylephrine will increase systemic vascular resistance and have that reflux in decreasing cardiac output and may cause a bradycardia. And that concludes the presentation on vasopressor agents in the emergency department.